When these four steps in Matthew 18 are followed, in the power of the Spirit, with a lot of prayer, God works. But the problem is, as many times these steps aren't taught, people aren't aware of them, so when a situation develops in the church, which it will, becomes a public scandal, nobody knows what to do, there's confusion, division uh, in the church, and uh, everyone suffers. So to any leaders that are listening to this lecture, I encourage you before there's a situation that you have to deal with in the church where that everybody becomes aware of, teach these principles. Prepare your people, prepare your leaders first of all, then prepare the congregation so that when it does happen and you need to take these steps, that people will be aware of what you're doing and why you're doing it, that it's based on scripture. If you wait until a real problem surfaces, people will be emotional, people will be divisive, there will be undue confusion, and uh, it will not be effective. So make sure you do that. And that you only take step four after all other attempts have been resisted. That's the last resort. I can't overemphasize that. But supposing you have to go through step one, you haven't won your brother. Step two, still resistant. Step three, you take it to the church, that has no effect on them. Step four, you expel a person, excommunicate them from the church. How do you respond to that person? How do you treat them now? What I'm about to share with you, the response to an unrepentant, unbroken person, the biblical response is this. It sounds harsh, it sounds unloving, but it's not if the attitude is right and you're wanting to follow God's directives. Because again, what you're doing is you're cooperating with God and bringing pressure on that person. That's what God does. If they're his child, he's going to discipline them. He's going to bring pressure on them until they break and are repentant. And you remember the story of the prodigal son would be a good example. He had to get all the way to the end of himself, in the pig pen, be broken, and then he returned to his father. What if some well-meaning people along the way had tried to intercept him and take pressure off that God was putting on? It's hard, especially when it's a relative or a friend or somebody you care about, to just stand back and let God do his work. But maybe these scriptures will help. And remember, you don't do them with a, with a condemning attitude, a self-righteous attitude, but you do that as a loving act to cooperate with a loving God who wants to bring that person to their senses. Here are some scriptures. Matthew 18, 17 is that fourth step, but he says, after you've expelled them from the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. 1 Corinthians 5, where Paul says, you need to deal with this person. It's involved with sexual immorality with his stepmother in the church. Everybody knows about it. He'd been condoning it. Put him out of your fellowship man who did this. Also in 1 Corinthians 5, he said, hand this man over to Satan. Why? So that the sinful nature might be destroyed, the flesh, so that God will put pressure on them. So his spirit will be saved on the day of the Lord. He'll come back to his senses and come back to fellowship. Same chapter, verses 9 and 11. Do not associate with sexually immoral people. He goes on in that chapter and says, I don't mean people of this world, but I mean people that profess to be believers, a brother, a sister in Christ. Then he says in Titus 3.10, concerning a divisive person, warn a divisive person once, then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. Sounds harsh, doesn't it? 
Romans 16, 17, talking about a divisive person. Watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you've learned. Keep away from them. 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, the undisciplined one. We command you, keep away from every brother who is idle and does not live according to the teaching you receive from us. Same chapter, take special note of him and do not associate with him. Tough language, isn't it? And we read that, we say that doesn't sound very loving, that doesn't sound kind. Aren't we supposed to love everybody? Aren't we supposed to show compassion and mercy? Yes, we are. But here's the point, and don't miss this. You've shown love and compassion to them and trying to restore them. They are resistant. They persist in their sin. Now a loving, compassionate act is to cooperate with a loving, compassionate God in bringing them to their senses by putting pressure on them. My friend Clyde, we had to go through the four steps, put him out of the church. People said, what do we do now? Should we try to have coffee with him or lunch with him and talk with him? I said, no, don't associate with him. Told his wife and his children, they were in the meeting when we excommunicated him. Don't have anything to do with him. Pray for him. Pray, pray, pray for him. Months went by. People occasionally would come to me and said, you know, I know where he works. Should I go see him? I said, no. Don't, don't, don't go see him. Step up your prayers for him. Then we heard one day that he was going in for major surgery on his back. And many people came to me, said, uh, should we send him flowers? Should we go visit him in the hospital? I said, no. I said, we shouldn't even send him flowers? Show him that we love and care for him? No. Because God's at work in his life. Let's step up our prayers for Tom. We love him, we care about him, uh, but God is working in his life. God is putting pressure in, in, on his life. God is starting to break up that hardened heart. Just like my friend Jeff. God said, he said when he came to the end, God was beginning to break his body so he could break his hardened heart. I saw in Clyde's case that God was bringing pressure on him, breaking his body so that he could break the hardened heart. He was in the hospital several days. We heard that he had the surgery, major stuff. One Sunday morning, I was getting ready to preach. The phone rang, one of the ushers answered the phone, said there's a man on the phone that desperately needs to talk to you. I said, I can't right now, I'm going in to preach. They said, he just needs to. And I felt prompted to the spirit. I went and picked up the phone quickly. And I heard this man's voice crying, broken, this is Clyde. Could you, would you come up and see me at the hospital after church? God has been working in my life. The tone of his voice was so different. I said, I'll be right up. He said, would you bring, and he named two other men, would you bring them with you, two of our elders that he'd been so defiant to. I got those two men after church we walked into his hospital room, and the moment I walked in the room, I knew, I knew that he'd been broken before God spiritually broken. There were those tears of repentance. There was that humility. There was that begging for forgiveness. He, and I knew that he had gotten right with God, and he said that. He said, in this hospital room, I've had to wrestle with what I've done. I've had to return to the Lord. I've acknowledged my sin. By God's grace, I don't want to go there again. I don't want to ever be there again. I need your forgiveness. I need the church's forgiveness, my wife and my family. And the humility and the brokenness 
was so very, very genuine. And of course we forgave him. And of course we began to work with him. And of course we restored him. And in time he was restored to his family. It took time having to rebuild that trust. And his family had to see that there was a change. And we voted him back into the church. And he became, once again, a useful member to the body of Christ. He's died, he's with the Lord now, but he ended his life walking with God in humility and grace. And I'm so glad it was not easy. Maybe we didn't do everything perfectly, but to the best of our ability, we tried to be obedient to scripture. And when you have cases like this, we're talking about church discipline or restoration. The goal is always restoration. That's what we're after. That first step in Matthew 18 says, go to your brother in private. If he listens to you, you've won your brother back. That's always what we want to do is to win him back through every one of the steps. And even in that last step, the goal is to win him back by cooperating with God. But again and again, I've seen those scriptures totally violated, totally neglected, totally ignored, and they wonder why our church is in the situation it is, and why God is not blessing our, our work, and why this constant drain upon our body. And so I encourage you, church leaders that are listening to this lecture, don't take my word for it, but take God's word for it. Study these passages of scripture for yourself. And you'll see that they're very clear, they're very to the point, and God honors his word. Not my word, not your word, but his word. And our commitment as pastors and leaders in the church is to be as honest as we can with the word of God and as obedient to the word of God as we possibly can, and God will honor that. TBS Seminary is a nonprofit project. Our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and or financial support of TBS Ministry. For more information, please visit tbsseminary.com.